Thanks for being around. I tried to cram three years of my PhD into half an hour, which is, <coughs> I guess, bound to fail. Um, and for, for research, I always do what I do best, and uh, I guess that's hanging out in kitchens. And uh, I was thrilled to learn at some stage that that is a legit research methodology. Uh, Stephanie is to blame for that. So I've been doing that ever since, and it's been a, a real joy. Um, when we think about uh, the Global South and how we can perhaps help some of those beautiful, beautiful countries to have a bit of a better life for their citizens. Um, tourism pops up across the board very often as apparently some form of a benign industry that has less impacts on society and, and the environment than many other industries. And so it's uh, been sort of supported as a means by which we can um, give local in, in, indigenous people a better life, income, um, a way to sell their produce to kitchens and restaurants. Uh, we can perhaps um, have happy chefs in restaurants and kitchens to use those local products um, as beautiful and fresh as they are um, for lovely dishes on the uh, tables of restaurants and hotels. And wouldn't that be sort of a beneficial kind of a triple bottom line for everyone involved? Uh, ever since about the late 70s, I think Belil was one of the very first to publish on that, uh, we have a whole host of papers and research projects on um, the beautiful applicability of local food systems in tourism for development purposes. Um, tourism Moms and Atu have published widely on that. Um, and funnily enough, though, it really, really emerges. And um, that's also been noted recently, quite often, I find. And my research is very much on how come that this concept, which makes so much sense because we all travel, we all like to eat food, I guess we're all somewhat claiming that we're interested in food, how come that this link between local producers in developing countries, um, restaurateurs and consumers doesn't really match to the benefit of the local people? Right. Um, here is Mr. Jananen from uh, Fiji. So I'm taking you across the globe to the other side. Um, Fiji, I don't, anyone has ever been, perhaps? Or anywhere close? Tonga, Samoa? No, right. Um, small island development states, all of them. Fiji uh, is in the South Pacific doing, I guess, better than many of the others, but still um, supposedly a development state. And you do see a lot of poverty, um, but you also see farmers who are happily growing local products of sorts. I'm not going to talk a lot about what they grow at the moment, but we'll come to that later on. Nevertheless, there's still poverty around. Um, there's quite a bit of friction between different ethnic uh, groups. They're the Itoke, the indigenous people of uh, Fiji. They make up about um, just under 60% of the population. There's another third, about a third that, that is of uh, Indian descent. They uh, were brought to Fiji by the colonial rule of uh, the British. And they decided to stay because they quite liked it. Um, and they regard themselves as Fijians as well, but they bring in a completely different cultural setup. And then there's a 6 7% of some other ethnic minorities. Um, especially the Indo-Fijians were in sugarcane farming a lot. That's not happening any longer. They now farm whatever they can sell, pretty much. Um, they are doing economically a little better than the Itoke, where we have only pictures of two children here. Uh, when they farm the Itoke, they're very much concerned with growing the food that they want for themselves. They are not very much what I would like to say, uh, tell, um, name as market gardeners. They garden and farm for their own needs, usually. Um, and then you would think that perhaps on an island like Fiji with 330 islands, two very big ones, there's a lot of farming happening, you would perhaps see a dish like this, 95% local on the restaurant menus fairly often. What we have here is a reef fish, um, a trigger fish, uh, with a coconut crust, um, plantains, um, a local, just a green stuff underneath here is a um, edible fern from the riverbeds, um, and a coconut sauce. Um, the only thing that's not local is the caper berries around here. They're probably from Sicily. Nevertheless, 95% of that would um, be sourced from Fiji. That was served in a large, about 350-room resort that I uh, did my research in. 
Uh, that resort had a number of restaurants, um, a buffet restaurant, a steak and pizza place, a pool bar, a second pool bar, a big buffet place, the lot. The usual sort of beachside resort. How often is that dish sold per day? Once, twice. Perhaps. Uh, yeah, I ordered that one, yeah. So I'm responsible for, <laughs> for one of them, right. Um, the reality looks rather different. Um, I'm going to bash the Anglo-Saxon cuisine a little bit. If you feel uncomfortable, let me know. What really sells in these resorts is fish and chips, steaks, pizzas, uh, a little bit of seafood, but only particular kind of seafood, burgers, sandwiches. The most ordered dish on the menu. Want to take a guess? Burger, second, was number two. Fish and chips. Yeah, for lunch, for sure, but not overall, the club sandwich. That resort used just under a ton of bacon per month. I broke down the numbers. A guest had 55 grams of bacon a day. Imagine. And none of it was wasted, by the way. After the, at the end of the breakfast buffet, it's all gone. The rest goes into sandwiches and so on and so forth. So I guess it's fair to say that the resort predominantly serves what I would like to call a Western hotel cuisine. Stuff that you find in any resort across the globe. Whether you go to the Hilton in Singapore or the Hyatt in Miami or the Marriott in, I don't know, Berlin. They all serve pretty much the same, sorry I'm stereotyping, Western cuisine. Very meat heavy, lots of deep fried stuff. Um, the chefs in this case uh, were particularly Fiji Indians, but also a couple of uh, indigenous Fijians that worked there. And they are basically, let's say, urged into a situation where they cook things that they are not used to. They learn to become a chef, like I guess we all could, but they learn a trade that they are in a way not familiar with because they need to cook food that they would never ever have at home. The concept of a pizza or a steak or something is, not, is nothing that they are fond of, that they like, that they like to have at home. She, I had a great interview with her and she said, listen Gabi, you know, with all this stuff here, I mean, we like to cook, we put in all of our heart, but if we have this at home, it gives us a runny stomach. Whatever she really meant by that, I don't really want to know, but certainly she wasn't fond of the stuff she was cooking. Okay, I mean, it's like you're doing research on stuff that you're not interested in, and that's their daily life. Then you would think, well, Fiji does produce a fair bit of food. Wouldn't resorts be sort of inclined to use that and procure that? And then you look at perhaps the most, how shall I put this, the most iconic product of South Pacific Islands, coconut milk, or lolo in that case. Uh, the lolo in this uh, resort, as well as in any other resort, rest assured, is uh, procured from Thailand, because Thailand has a coconut industry, whereas Fiji grows lots of coconuts, but there's no industry attached to it that makes it available in cans, so that you can just open the can and pour it on top of whatever, and then there you go. So <clears throat> you have a situation and I'm not only talking about the Outrigger Resort where I did my research in because I talked to all other big brand multinational resorts and they pretty much across the board have the same situation. They have customers who are not interested in the local food. They have chefs who are not used to Western dishes. Some of them have, have a different ethnic background. They would rather cook curry than any Fijian Itoke food. And you have products which perhaps are available locally, but actually are not procured locally because of the fact that they're not made in an industrial way so that they're easy to procure and use. And then you have the good old commodification of culture happening in all these resorts. Every once a week, they have a um, culture night, something special, something for the tourists, something to satisfy your view of what you think Fiji should look like. So obviously, we have lots of halfway naked men. Uh, the women are sort of in the back here. Um, at least they had something to cover their breasts, um, which sort of rattle spears and torches and try to enact a picture that is somewhat 
mm. archaic, perhaps, is the word, and satisfies the white tourists' mm. longing for the otherness or a, a sort of, uh, how shall I put this, stereotypical picture of the South Pacific Islands. Whether or not that is particularly um, true or not, I guess that question is not asked. On the buffet, which you sort of see on the right-hand side here, and it extends further to the right, um, there were lots of foods and dishes that perhaps are, you can call them local, but some of them are made of New Zealand salmon, and there certainly needs to be oysters on the buffet, and green lip mussels from New Zealand, and a lot. Uh, when you talk to the local waiters and the chefs, they all say, yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, this is somewhat local, but actually, no. But it satisfies the tourists, that's for sure, and that's perhaps the main thing, because they pay the bill. <coughs> that brings us to a situation where 65% of the food that this particular resort um, procured was imported. Um, this big chunk here, the biggest of the lot, uh, is beef from Tasmania. Because there is a bit of local beef, actually, you could procure quite a bit, but it has a funny taste, all the chefs said, because all the guests said it has a funny taste, so we stay off it. Um, most of this is actually chicken, which is produced in Fiji, but then the feed and the little ch chicks, the they're probably not produced in Fiji, so all that money that goes into chicken meat, probably most of it leaves the country again to go abroad. Um, dry goods is a difficult story because you need quite a bit of industry to produce that. That is not available in Fiji, so that's all the meat, uh, the, um, sorry, the vinegar, the oils, the canned goods, the pff, rice noodles, all that sort of stuff. Imported. Fish is a very political subject. Um, China provides a fair bit of development aid to Fiji. And in return, they quite like to have fishing grounds. So some chefs said, you know what, Fiji is interesting because Fiji is an island without fish. Because all the fish gets caught and then, before it even gets off the boat, is already sold to, well, not the Fijians. Uh, fruit and vegetable is, has the highest share of local products. Um, but certainly the outrigger needed to um, import oranges and apples and, you know, stuff that you and I are very familiar with, because if we travel abroad to Fiji or some other exotic place, well, we'd really like to have our apples for breakfast, don't we? Um, I could go on a long time about all this, um, but I, to cut a long story short, what is perhaps where most sort of potential lies for Fiji to have more of their tourism money flow into the country and stay in the country through the food chain is certainly meat, vegetables, and fruits, and dairy. That could perhaps happen on a fairly sort of short, midterm range. Um, and Fiji's sort of agricultural planning certainly includes that notion that that would be a very good idea to do. Um, Tourists spend about 20 to 30% of their spending on food, and that would make a fair bit of money that potentially could stay in Fiji. Um, the question now is whether that would be a good idea or not, and I'd like to reflect on that a bit on the next slide. That's just a little picture to see how the Fijians actually eat, and it's very, very different from how I guess the tourists eat, because you would have fish heads and turtle curry um, and um, fried plantains and these sort of things. And you, um, as a researcher, you stay in the village and you eat with them and it's, it's lovely dishes, but it's sort of difficult to see how a lot of Australian and New Zealand tourists would be happy to have fish heads for lunch or very spicy tomato chutney or turtles being slaughtered for their lunch. Um, but that's a completely local lunch in this case. Um, that one? That's uh, yams and cassava. Yeah, um, those are not fish heads, just fried fish because they're smaller. Uh, but the head is always the most prized part of the fish. And they're very, very happy when you turn up as a, as a, you know, as a white man 
that you can yet eat fish heads to some degree, even though the eyes might not be quite your cup of tea, but they're very happy if you start, you know. But when you see a Fijian eating a fish head, they go, and out comes this beautiful white skull, and everything else is gone. So they're very, um, yeah, they have just a very different connection to the food, I'd say. Yeah. Um, probably just a, a few more words on that. The, uh, there's also a cultural theme in here whereby um, a turtle meat must only be served in a chiefly family. No one else is allowed to touch turtle meat. So by the food you are served, you can already tell what type of family you are in. Um, what else could I tell you about this? Well, you eat on the ground. Um, on what plates? Is this plates? Individual plates? Yes. Uh, I guess they're only there because of me. Otherwise, you would have just bowls in you. Mix and share. Yes, completely. Um, not sure whether they would usually have a spoon, but they're not, I mean, they, they don't like to sort of mix the food in the bowl. So you, you use a spoon, yeah. Um, there's also a fridge in the kitchen, by the way. So it's not, you know, they have electricity. They don't, they, I hate to use the word, but there's a, there's a certain amount of civilization in there. But they, they add, in the villages where they live, they definitely retain a fair bit of traditional food culture, if you so want to say. Yeah. Um, and that uh, implement must never be missed because of all the flies that you need to keep away from the food. Yeah. Any other questions about the local food? Where is the food coming from? <laughs> uh, all of it is from the local reef the sea or the market. So I'd say it's probably less than a 50 mile radius. Um, yeah, no, I think that's, that's fair to say. The pineapple slices might be from a bit further up, actually grown further up on the island somewhere because Tavioni is the place where they usually grow pineapple because of the, um, the climate. Uh, but it's definitely bought in the local market. Yeah, um, but I brought that to the lunch, so I guess it was my way of participating, and I'm, I have a, a sweet tooth, so I quite like to have something sweet. Uh, there's no freezer, so ice cream isn't available. Um, but I thought pineapple would be suitable. And um, I didn't quite factor in the fact that their, their teeth are not necessarily in the best shape. And the pineapple, the fibrous pineapple, usually sort of starts to stick in between the teeth, and that causes a bit of commotion after lunch. But um, they liked it nevertheless. Right, um, we can go back to that picture before the questions if you like later. Um, yeah, then let's just have a quick uh, word on the farmers. Um, the farming community in Fiji is really sort of separated into two areas. Uh, the Indo-Fijians that we see here, they don't own land usually, they um, pay local landowners to farm. They um, produce food partly for themselves but mostly to sell in the market. Uh, here you see a big field of cassava in the background, um, leafy greens here in the front, uh, tomatoes, and I'm not quite sure what they are about to grow here. Um, if and when hotels buy food, they usually buy from these communities because they are as close to a market gardener as it gets. The Itoke, the indigenous people, they farm mostly for themselves and their own tribes. Uh, there's a lot of foraging going on. And they have a hard time coming around to the idea of, let's make a contract with a hotel and supply them 20 kg of whatever every week. We've had situations where, they, where chefs said, listen, I've ordered God knows what, lobster, cassava, I don't know what. And the first week it worked. The second week they rang him up and said, Where's my food? He said, no, 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 you paid me enough last week. I'm fine. There, there's no concept of, but we had a deal. The deal for them is they need money now to put their kids into school, to pay for a wedding, to do some kind of a cultural representation of sorts. The moment they have their 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever it is, they're fine. Until the point in time where they again need the money. Um, and no hard feelings involved, but they don't see the need to go and farm and 
supply food on a regular basis to someone they have little connection with. And so all the chefs across the board said, we hardly do business with them because they're not, to us, they're not reliable business uh, partners. Um, the Indo-Fijians, however, have a different problem. They say the hotels buy usually, I think the word would be erratically. So this month, they might really like to have asparagus and, I don't know, fennel, because they like to put that on the menu for the next one or two months. Perhaps half a year later, they like cherry tomatoes. Perhaps a couple of months later, they like to put leek and onions, or God knows what. And for the farmers, they, that gives them a very hard life because obviously they work in different time patterns. If they plant cassava or eggplant or whatever today, it takes a couple of months until they harvest. If it has gone out of fashion for the hotels by then, no deal. And surely the hotels were not going to pay them up front for something that they may or may not deliver in three months. So there's sort of a lot of insecurity in that relationship. Um, Yeah, and then there's a route around that for in, uh, indo fijian farmers, and that is they sell to exporters. So large-scale operations that export to New Zealand, Australia, Canada, US, perhaps a bit of Japan. Interestingly enough, mostly to the Indian community in those countries, because they like to grow what they know, what they eat for themselves, and so that can be exported to other people who have a similar cuisine in their everyday life. Uh, the exporter works completely different. They say, I need 20 kg of whatever it is uh, by the end of the year or next month or whenever it is. Here's the deal, here's the money, go do it. There's a very straightforward, very reliable contract. There's no, what the farmers always refer to as haywire buying. Oh, a bit of this, oh no, not next month, oh, perhaps a bit of that, oh, now I need a lot, now I need nothing. None of this. It's very reliable, very forecastable. Uh, the gastronomy and the, the tourism industry usually doesn't buy like that. Unless you talk about, you know, staple products like wheat or onions or tomatoes. Okay, fair enough. Then there's a certain reliability. But uh, lots of other fruits and vegetables are, you know, up and down. Right. That brings us to a situation where I'd like to briefly um, reflect on the SDGs as promised in the outline of this seminar um, and the implications of what would happen if Fiji was to propose, produce more of the food on the islands that tourists actually like to eat? Meat, certain kinds of vegetables, dairy. Um, and I'm thrilled to have a, say again? Geomorphologist. Geomorphologist, thank you very much, amongst us, who will, most will be very happy to explain the actual effects way better than I can. If you cut down a forest and sort of turn this, which is central Fiji, uh, at least the main island, uh, if you turn this into grazing grounds, you'll have um, fairly soon an amazing amount of silt and erosion flushing down the main rivers. And what you see here um, on the other side is um, <sighs> coral reefs around the main islands. Um, and you can already sort of see by the shades of gray, brownish in here that there's a bit of erosion always happening. But if you have massive erosion from chopping down woodlands and forests and bushes, um, and on a tropical island it rains quite a fair, you know, quite a bit, uh, you kill the reef, quite frankly. Um, has happened before when they turned a lot of this into sugarcane plantations, by the way. And the reef systems is uh, A, supports quite a bit of livelihood for the local women and, and fisher people. It, it's also home to pelagic fish, or at least the uh, young fish. Um, and that would have quite severe implications. Um, and if you don't, if you, as a hotel, if you're unable to buy from the local small-scale producers, you're very much unable to support, in a way, their livelihood and therefore their need to sell food or grow food that they actually are happy to eat for themselves. If you have farmers that, sort of, if they wanted to participate from tourism, need to grow things that they are completely unfamiliar with and unhappy to eat, by the way, you're not making that link at all. 
Uh, and I think in that case, uh, SDG 2 and 15 are very much linked um, because here we're talking about a sustainable um, terrestrial ecosystem. Um, growing beef, or sorry, not growing beef, but, but keeping cattle in larger herds uh, for dairy or, or beef. Uh, on an island like this, uh, in a terrain like this, is perhaps not the best of all ideas. Um, SDG 8 and 12 actually are uh, the two um, that very much call on sustainable on tourism to be sustainable for uh, sustainable consumption and production. Um, and there's a lot of talk about making sure that tourism supports local culture and the way the big resorts, I'm not talking about the small individual ones, but the big ones, the Hilton's Heights and so forth, the way they go about Supporting local culture, I think, is not what we can term a very sustainable way. Uh, life below water, I think, is very much connected to life on land and the idea of um, using small island development states and their, you know, usually uh, fragile ecosystems um, to produce the, the kind of food you need for Western cuisine. Um, funnily enough, Fiji presided over COP23 uh, not too long ago in Bonn. Uh, and they urged the, low, the, the global community to cut down CO2, um, yet in the agricultural plan, um, they think, yeah, growing beef is a very good idea, um, which I think is, is very much at odds. So from my perspective, um, big resorts, big tourism, internationally uh, managed tourism on small island development states such as Fiji does not support SDGs, certainly not those in a very good way. Um, my suggestion is to definitely think about how can we downscale tourism on those islands and perhaps in other developing countries much more. Uh, we have that situation in Samoa that said we will have two or three multinational resorts and the rest is all small scale. We do not give, um, what's the word? We do not give a license to big hotels anymore. We may have two or three, that's it. And guess what happens if you have a small scale, fragmented, locally owned tourism industry? Well, they buy from their brothers and sisters and cousins and they cook differently. And, and the funny thing is, it works. Tourists go and eat there. It's not that they are served something that they don't know and then they don't eat it, no. It, it actually supports quite a, a different kind of tourism than the big scale resort tourism. Uh, but Fiji is uh, apparently at the moment not going down that route. Uh, a last note on methodology. Um, there's a lovely Fijian researcher that has um, published uh, one of the very few articles on how can you do in sort of tour, um, uh, how can you create a methodology that is in line with indigenous ways of knowing. And she said, well, you have to go and live with the people and you have to actually see what they do, not just look around. You have to hear actually what they say and take it in and not just listen. And I would add to this, you have to actually taste and not just eat to understand what, uh, what their way of life is all about. And um, I think now it's time for questions, if you have.